Beautiful. Good evening, everyone. Welcome aboard. Uh, welcome to 2021. Hopefully, it's going to be a lot better than 2020. Um, my name is Peter, the president of the Space Association. Um, this is a bit of an experiment tonight. Uh, we're trying to multitask here. We've got obviously uh, a huge number of people here in the room in South Melbourne, but we've also got a, a bunch of people, about a dozen people, on Zoom. So welcome uh, where, where, where you are. Charlie, I think you've um, reached the dress code. You know, you don't have a shiver. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs> oh, God, I've got the outfits. All right, welcome board. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, first meeting for 2020, and let's hope it's a better year than uh, 21, uh, 20. Um, so we're going to new president in America. So. Uh, Let's see how that pans out. This is obviously not a real image. Um, but I just stumbled on this this afternoon. I thought people might be interested to look at it or listen to it. Um, this uh, space, space economy podcast, Marsha Smith, she's a, an American journalist, been involved in the space program for many years. So this, um, this podcast is actually took place just after the election in November, when the Senate was still not decided. Uh, um, but it, I've only listened about half of it, but I thought people might be interested to uh, to take a listen to that. So just do a search on Sad, SoundCloud, Marsha Smith on space policy, you'll come up with that. So that's the podcast. I just popped in that. Time. So tonight's program, um, I'm going to bore you for about 15 minutes or so with association news. There's not a huge amount going on, but we've got a few things that we need to take care of. Um, then I've got a bit of a round up of Australian space news. Once again, not a huge amount, but uh, nice to see. Um, and then we've got our guest speaker, John Lim, uh, with the feature of the night, uh, just at Astro, is that correct pronunciation? Yeah. Okay, I've got a nod that yeah, So this is a tiny project, uh, project in space law, so I'm really fascinated to find out all about this. And uh, obviously very relevant uh, now with uh, with all the things that are happening in the private sector uh, and people throwing stuff at the moon and putting things on the moon and driving around the moon and who knows what. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what John from the project's all about. Then we're going to have a bit of a break at 8.15 and then we'll come back with uh, Angelo Di Gracia doing his International Space Roundup. Um, I've just seen a little bit of what he's I've heard a little bit of what he's got there, and it's going to be fascinating to see what's going on there. Uh, and things you might have missed, so Andrew is always good value uh, to listen to. Um, so, for the Space Association members and people that want to be members, uh, we've been talking about this the last 12 months. We haven't had an AGM since uh, 2019. Uh, we were supposed to have one in May 2020. Uh, obviously, with COVID, we weren't able to do that. Um, Got an extension from Consumer Affairs. So we've now, now that we're meeting physically again, we're going to have our AGM this coming February. Uh, in fact, because it is an AGM required each, each year, of course, and the 2021 meeting would be needed to have been held by the end of May. So the committee's decided that we're going to combine both the 2020 and the 2021 meetings as a single uh, rip the band out, rip the band out off event. So uh, that's going to happen uh, immediately prior to our regular meeting, which will happen next month, the twenty second of February. Um, and uh, obviously, paid up members uh, will get notification of all the details around that. They can nominate for uh, positions on the committee, um, be involved in the um, the, uh, the plans for going forward with the association and administer the millions of dollars that we spend on international travel for the committee going to squat space launch and that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll send details out to you in the next few weeks on that. Um, for those who are not familiar with the association, we're a non-profit, non-political group. We meet monthly. And the way that we do that is the schedule we've got is the first Monday of the month except in December, because that's getting a bit cool. Fourth Monday, let's say the first. 
course, Monday the month. Obviously, the December month is a bit crazy. So, as I mentioned, the next month's meeting will be the 22nd of February, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, go and work it out. Um, so we'll be doing the live meetings here in South Melbourne. So if you happen to be in Victoria, in Melbourne on that night, come along, it's free. Anyone can come. Uh, we're a friendly bunch. We can have something to eat and a couple of drinks and have a chat. Uh, but obviously we're going to keep this Zoom um, uh, tenants uh, going, which is what we used through 2020. And it was actually quite a, quite a good experience and got a lot more people as well. So thank you for that. Thanks for the best experience. So, just a couple of things that we've got in the planning stage for the association. People may or may not have seen this movie called Apollo 11 by Todd Douglas Miller. Um, basically, it's incredible. I've seen it. A few, few people have seen it, but uh, uh, it's, it's using the original film from uh, 1969 that was used uh, when they were making the films back then. 70 millimeter film. The film itself, this new release, was released last year, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, uses all the original semi film, well, uses 70, 70 millimeter film, which was actually taken out of the archives because all the stuff that we'd seen between 69 and basically 2018 was the NASA released 16 millimeter derivatives of the 70 millimeter film. So it's always been that scratchy, chunky, clunky stuff. So they've gone back, the directors of this film have gone back to the original film, the 70 millimeter film and, and put it together and it's spectacular. It's like it was filmed last Thursday, it's amazing. So, um, if you like space, you'll love this film. It's not a drama today, dramatization, it's an actual documentary. Uh, and I'll just show you a quick promo. I'd like to know what you think of that as far as responsibility for the private That's uh, relatively difficult to answer. It's a job that we collectively said that it was possible, we could do it. Of course, the nation itself was backing us, so we was sincerely hope that we measure up with that. Yeah. Okay, now there's a reason I showed that. Bear with me for a second. Um, another film uh, that's been released is called Searching for Skylab. And Searching the Sky Lab was actually uh, released officially in uh, 2019. Um, and it's obviously talking about the Sky Lab mission. The written by, the script was written by Carl Lisi and directed by Dwight Stephen Bonecki, who's actually an Australian who's now living in Europe. Um, and it was sort of crowdfunded as well. So. Anyway, uh, it's great to bring attention to this Sky Lab mission. The preview of this working version was uh, screened at Space Fest in 2018 uh, to a crowd of space experts, astronauts, and their families. And also, Angela, not Angela, and, uh, Michael, Angela, and me. We were in the audience that day and we met uh, Stephen 
and the Dwight, and we uh, we watched the film, and and uh, we struck up with quite a good friendship and had a really long chat. We've stayed in touch with Dwight, and he's very very uh, uh, keen to have it screened here in Australia. It actually did make a, a screening here back in 2019 in WA uh, in the university when um, when the um, I think we were re-entered. Anyway, um, he's very keen to have us uh, part of uh, continuing that on. So uh, I'll just show you a quick clip of that as well, um, that, and you'll get the understanding of why. Yes. We watch the ones from the roof of the immense space operations for dynamic for the tower. Right, so since that uh, viewing that Michael and I saw in 2018 in, in Space Test, uh, Dwight went through and re edited and recut the film and made it, um, he improved it immensely according to him. I haven't seen it, so he's uh, very proud of the end product. All right, now another thing, now hang in with me for a second, we'll get to the what will pull this together. Uh, I think most people will know who this person is, Yuri Gagarin. Um, and people may or may not be aware of Yuri's Night, which is a. They're going to be there, yes, I can guarantee you. Uh, uh, Yuri's Night was, uh, was launched in 20, so 2001, uh, April 12. So that was the actual anniversary of, of Yuri Gaon's flight, which is obviously the first human to orbit the Earth. Uh, it also happened to be the first flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 1981. So on the 10th anniversary uh, in 2011, the UN designated April 12 as the International Day of Human Space Flight. So Yui's Night has sort of come together to be a global celebration for on and around the April 12th. Uh, and this year, 2021, is actually the 60th anniversary of of that of you is flight. So why have I showed you those last three things? Okay, the association is working on a plan to have a space day um, on April the 12th, uh, April the 11th, Sunday, April 11th at the Sun Theatre in Yarraville. For those people that may have attended, we did our Apollo 
11 50th anniversary event uh, in July uh, back in 2019. It seems like a long time ago. Um, the 50th anniversary was a fantastic day. And uh, the Sun Theatre, the people that run it and the guy that owns it are all real space nuts. So they love it. So we're going to have this day, uh, afternoon, evening uh, event on Sunday, the April 11th. The rough plan at this point is we'll have a, uh, a Yui's Night sort of theme. We'll have a bit of a presentation on Yui Gagarin and the first flight. That is space flight, 11 film. The reason being, I mean, it was run during the Space Fest, uh, what was they called? The uh, Moon Festival at the Sun Theatre. And it got a very limited release and maybe most people in the room saw it, maybe a lot of people didn't. I know a few people I spoke to have not seen it, I'd love to see it. So you can get it on YouTube and that sort of thing or, or whatever, but this is going to be on the big screen. So I think I'm going to be there in, in, in a flash. Uh, I think it'd be really spectacular. Enough. And to see this film on big screen is certainly something to, uh, to be... Uh, so I'm just reading the messages. Okay. Um, then we're going to have a little bit of a break at 6 p.m. And 7 p.m. we'll come back and we'll do an Australia uh, Apollo and Skylab to talk about the Australian contribution to the Apollo and Skylab program, which was very significant. Uh, people may obviously be aware that um, Apollo was very, uh, Australia was very critical in deep space communication with. Uh, with the Apollo program, uh, it also played a significant role in Skylab. In fact, some of the people, the, the flight controllers or the tracking guys in Australia say that Skylab was actually the highlight of their career. Um, so that'll be good. Then we're gonna run the film, they're searching for Skylab at roughly 7.45 p.m. Uh, now, for people that have been to some of our virtual meetings, we had a uh, uh, 50th anniversary for Apollo 13 last year, April, 19, uh, 2020, and then we had actually uh, Joe Kerwin join us, who people may have no, he was kind of the lead Capcom for Apollo 13, but also he flew on Skylab. So uh, at that stage, he was extremely keen to be involved in anything we do here in Australia. So still got to tee that up with him, but um, that could be really nice. Joe's, Joe's a great guy. And then we're going to be finish up about 10.30 at this stage. So um, we haven't finalised all the details and the ticketing and how it's all going to work. Um, that'll come in the next uh, few weeks. So keep your eye on your social media and your email information and uh, we'll let you know what's happening there. That's provided the COVID thing um, doesn't throw a spanner in the works as it did for an Apollo 13. So Sun, Sun Theatre in Yarraville, People are not aware, just over the Westgate Bridge, turn right. Uh, Buzz may or may not be there, I don't know. He just turned 91 this week, so good on you, Buzz. Uh, so it's some theatre, some theatre, uh, yeah. So Apollo 11 and Skylab should be great. Now, um, the original plan for Apollo 13 50th back in April of 2020, back in the old days, uh, we were going to have an interstate. Uh, speaker come down. Uh, as part of that, we actually booked a hotel accommodation for him. COVID hit and we weren't able to bring him down. So the association has a voucher for a night in Williamstown at the uh, Quest of Williamstown. Um, so it has to be used before the 18th of April. So if anyone's interested in having a romantic weekend in Williamstown, we've got a deal for you. Um, yeah, so we're gonna we haven't worked out what we're going to do with this yet, but if someone can think they can use it, um, um, we will um, have a chat to you about how we might hand it over to you. Um, obviously, the association has paid for it, and if we don't use it, it'll just go uh, out the door. So it seems like a waste. So if someone's got an interest or a need, or Tim's excited about it, he's going to take his wife out to Williamstown. Fantastic, Tim. I'll I'll uh, let her know about that. So let me know, we'll send that information with regards to that. So um, zooming back out, the association is a voluntary group. We don't, um, we don't, uh, uh, everyone's volunteer here. Uh, all the things we do are paid for basically out of membership fees. And um, uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, renewing your membership or 
for um, for getting somebody else involved. We love to hear from you. Tim is here, the membership officer, and um, you can join online if you want, if you wish as well. Um, next month is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 14. I just came across this image the other day. I thought it was a mock-up, but it, apparently it's a genuine image um, with Al Shepard with his camera out and Ed Mitchell in the back then. So, fantastic. I love it. Um, yeah, so we, that'll be our February 22nd meeting will be part of that. Space up here. Um, I'm missing a slide here, aren't I? Oh, the AGM, no. Did I talk about the AGM? I did. Yeah, so the AGM will happen directly before the meeting next month. So seven to eight will be the AGM and then we'll get into the regular meeting content. So I'm just gonna do a quick and dirty Australian space news. Well, it won't be dirty, but it'll be quick. Um, uh, my Rotter joins the groundbreaking South Australian Space Services mission. Um, they announced her involvement in the SASAT-1 Space Services mission to deliver space services to South Australia as part of a, a $6.5 million partnership with the SA government. So South Australia seems to be really proactively investing in space. Obviously, they've got the, space aid, the Australian Space Agency headquarters here, which I guess it's chicken and egg. I don't know whether they got it because they are so involved or they're so involved because they've got the agency head, but I'm not sure. Um, so this SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre will lead this mission and um, and Adelaide-based manufacturing company Innovore Technologies designing and building the satellite. So that should be good. So the satellite will provide support data collection from ground-based sensors plus Earth observation imaging via hyperspectral electro-optical payload. I like it. So the mission will deliver the satellite in 15 months from well, this press release was I think about a month ago. So um, so watch out for that. Uh, Adelaide Uni students, once again more South Australian youth, uh, through the final round of the NASA Space Robotics Challenge. So the University of Adelaide, they've been gone into this Space Robotics Challenge. The only Australian team to have made it through to the final. Um, the teams are tasked to design code that will control a fleet of different lunar robots that must locate, excavate, load and transport water, ice and other volatile substances to a lunar landing craft. So, so the code will be used, could be used as part of NASA's Artemis program. The windows will be announced in September of this year. Uh, the Australian Space Agency has released a communications technology services roadmap, uh, providing a 10 year plan. Uh, and you can download the uh, roadmap from this URL. I don't expect you to copy the down, but just do a search on, on that and you should come across that, uh, that uh, document. Um, as part of that, they're going to be holding a webinar on Thursday, the 11th of February, 9 to 10, 10 30 a.m. And uh, you just need to go to, uh, and I'll have Michael Howe, Howe Hose, Director of Space Domain, Department of Defence, and Catherine Benel Pegg, Assistant Manager of Chief, Chief Technology Office. Uh, go for about an hour. It's aimed at businesses, industry, and anyone else who's interested. So you just need to go to a, just do a search on Eventbrite and you'll come across that uh, event. That's free. Uh, Hayabusa mission, as we probably all saw back in December, it uh, got its uh, um, return capsule back from Ryugu. And um, so it did retrieve some samples and uh, landed in the movement of prohibited area. And it was supported by the Australian Space Agency and the Department of Defence. So they were very happy about that. Uh, there's an inquiry into developing space industry, Australian space industry, and they're calling for submissions. 29th of January. So as soon as you leave here, go home and write up your submission. Um, and there's also public hearings. So if you want to get involved, you contact the committee secretary on these channels. Once again, if you wish, you can go to the um, Australian Space Agency office and uh, the website and you'll find the links to all of this stuff. Okay, back to Apollo 11. 
and something we've all been gritting our teeth about quarantine. Uh, Michael Abdul alerted to me, alerted me to this just um, yesterday. Now, I've been to the IMAX theatre website in Melbourne. It's not listed there on January 29th, so obviously it's a American thing, but hopefully at some point it will come to IMAX. So uh, there we go. So that's me done. I'd now like to introduce our feature speaker, Jonathan Lim. So Jonathan uh, is involved in this Just Ad Astra project. And once again, I think I've messed up the pronunciation, so I do apologise. He's an Australian law geopolitical analyst and a cybersecurity analyst. Um, so these are some of his qualifications here. Um, really delighted to have Jonathan along. I'll just um, get off this and we'll get over to your presentation and get started. Anything you need? Ashley, do you have any videos? I've got it here. It's already open. Oh, no, no, that's not his, that's mine. His. It's his microphone. Yeah. 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 Right, thank you, Peter. So, hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Lim. I'm the project colleague to Just Out Australia. And today, I'll be presenting my views regarding the need for human rights values and principles in creating a philosophical, moral, legal, and policy basis for supporting the advancement of human activities across the final frontier, encompassing humanity's anticipated presence throughout space and upon other celestial bodies in the near future. Can I speak up a little bit? Let's put this big there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Smart. So just to provide some background as to just at Astra, the project was started in January of 2020 and it's a yeah, approximately 14 members at the moment. We have a, a mix of research directors, legal advisors, research assistants and so forth, each responsible for exploring the role which human rights plays across outer space activities within their defined research areas, including economic, social and cultural law, property law, environmental law, the rule of law, uh, law of conflict and war, and health law. So some of our most recently issued work covers the need for a right to peace in moderating international conflicts in space, the, need, the issue of disability rights in space, and the need for a human right to emergency access to space habitats. Our objective here is to set upon promoting broad discussion and analysis concerning the relationship between human rights values and principles in outer space. We seek to clarify the application of existing terrestrial human rights framework into the outer space domain and we believe that it holds many benefits for a future human space faring civilization in that sense by enabling states and communities to respect, protect, and fulfill their human rights obligations across the final frontier. So, the impetus for starting this project was given the distinct lack of academic. Uh, discourse and dialogue concerning the role and the intersection between human rights and outer space. While there have admittedly been some debates concerning social concerns, uh, is it, uh, social arts and legal policy issues in space heritage, we believe that human rights here provides a fundamental perspective that underlies all of these areas. And through which these areas can be realized and addressed. So yeah, just uh, to start off, my desire to explore this intersection was due to my personal interest in science fiction and, and movies, as with 
most people here, including Stargate, Martian, and Expat, and <coughs> noting the various influences of artists and authors, the role of science fiction serves to inspire innovation in the real world and those looking towards the future of humanity. Across science fiction media, the notion of law and policy and order often appears as a secondary consideration to political intrigue, technological advancements, drama, and plot development. However, the presence of more human minds provides a, a means of resolving conflict in that sense, addressing moral dilemmas, balancing our perspectives on different cultures, and so forth. One key example here concerns, say, the opening episode of The Expanse, as uh, many of you might recall, where you have the UN Deputy Secretary General, Christian Abusrala, who was uh, subjecting a belter to what was known as gravity torture, in that sense. And that sort of brought me to mind as to what kind, what kind of rights are in play there, what kind of laws are in place there? Does that person have rights to prevention against torture, which we already have here in the present day? So, in addition to that, we can also consider, say, hypotheticals as to people living in our space and on the celestial bodies in the near future. For example, you have a space laborer who's working on a colony on the moon, mining resources under the employment of a, a private space mining company. However, the laborer's presence on the moon has come at a great financial cost to the company, which had to transport them there, provide basic elements critical to survival, oxygen, water, and so forth, and it's paid out of any of their wages earned. So the question arises then, what happens if that person loses their job? Who can they turn to? What recourse can they seek? Another example, you have a couple living on a space station who's looking to, to conceive and birth a child. However, the microgravity environment of outer space and the, the effects of cosmic radiation present an inherent and significant concern concerning their ability to conceive and carry the fetus to full term. What precautions can therefore be taken to minimize this risk? And do these precautions represent best practice? And how will these precautions ultimately translate to the rights of the child when the child is birthed eventually? So space is hard given the unique technical, physiological and policy challenges associated. And here in the exploring of this intersection between human rights and space presents a new opportunity to ensure that all human beings continue to be treated with dignity, equality and respect and to recognize how technology and the environment of outer space will inhibit or support humanity's presence among the stars. So human rights are rights inherent to all human beings, whatever nationality, place of residence, gender, or so forth. We're all equally entitled to our human rights without discrimination. These rights are interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. Moving down this list, the notion of human rights is outlined by six of the following principles. Firstly, the universality of such rights. All people everywhere in the world are entitled to them. Secondly, all human rights are indivisible, that they are civil, political rights, and the right to life in accordance with full law. And all of these rights are interdependent and interrelated, and they cannot be simply picked and um, chosen to follow some and disregard others. Third, in that sense, also, each right contributes to the realization of a person's human dignity through the satisfaction of their developmental, physical, physiological, and spiritual needs. Fourth, all persons and institutions, including the state, are accountable to just, fair, and equitable laws. Fifth, all people have the right to participate in and access information relating to the decision-making processes that affect their everyday lives. It's a bit of a feedback, was it? Yeah, yeah, it's good to say. Okay. 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 Yep. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So yeah, and finally, states and other duty bearers are answerable to the observation for the observance of human rights. States must comply with the legal norms and standards enshrined across international human rights instruments to which they have agreed. So in summary, the inherent, inalienable, and universal nature of human rights enables the establishment of a new governance framework in space and upon other celestial bodies, one directed at safeguarding the fundamental dignity and value of every human being. So in that sense, what benefits are tied to human rights? Well, firstly, human rights ensures that every person's need to access 
essential elements such as food, water, oxygen, shelter, and healthcare must be met to ensure a baseline level of integrity and existence conducive to prosperity and social harmony. Second, human rights protect vulnerable groups, including racial minorities, religious minorities, and disabled persons. Third, human rights is seen as the guarantor of fundamental freedoms and civil rights, including freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of press, and other values integral to a free and open society. Fourth, human rights protect the environment by encouraging sustainable practices and environmental responsibility. And finally, human rights provide a universal standard, which is widely accepted for holding governments accountable to both each other and to their citizens. So yeah, by highlighting the context and background of human rights in the domain of outer space, attention may be turned to several key events which took place during the Cold War space race. Here in national space programs of the US and the Soviet Union provide potential insights into the elementary considerations of human rights values and principles across outer space affairs. So firstly, we have the Soyuz 1 mission back in 1967, which uh, you may all recall had Vladimir Komarov tasked with officials to participate in the first mid-space rendezvous between two Soviet spaceships, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Communist Revolution. However, Komarov express, did express serious concerns regarding this spaceship regarding the spacecraft regarding the existence of 203 structural defects within that spacecraft and the issue of how the net issue of national pride in this instance took precedence in forcing the mission to proceed regardless so consequently Kolmov would perish when the descent module of this craft crashed into the ground upon re-entry due to a parachute failure and the question arises did Kolmov say right to life uh, was it violated by Soviet authorities in this instance and then in the second instance, we also have the 1975 uh, U.S. Soviet's uh, the rendezvous mission between um, a U.S. and Soviet vehicle, which required active collaboration in managing the ECLSS systems regarding atmospheric, um, atmospheric pressure and content between the two differing uh, national spacecrafts and the creation of a docking module. And in this case, the success of the mission represented an immense technical achievement, which contributed to a baton between the two powers, while also advancing that the respect and recognition of individual human safety and the elements required in meeting those, those standards should, be, should play a continuous part within international, international space affairs. And then finally, we have the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, where it was discovered that NASA's management ignored the recommendations of its engineers regarding the effects of below freezing temperatures upon the O-rings and the integrity of the rockets. Herein, upon launch, we had some people perish as a result when the vehicle exploded in mid-launch. And the question arises again, was the right to life of these seven astronauts violated by NASA? So the presence of human rights is something which has been existent since the beginning of human spaceflight. These examples provide, uh, these examples demonstrate the associated dangers involved with states place the need for national pride and national interest over that of individual human rights and dignity, demonstrating the beginnings of how states can also can begin to cooperate in addressing the policy, technical and um, physiological challenges associated with fulfilling basic human rights associated with ECLSS systems in outer space. So the intersection between human rights and outer space can be viewed through two perspectives here. Firstly, you have the use of space applications in order to help support, monitor, and enforce terrestrial human rights. This has been seen through the use of Earth observation satellites to help decision makers understand trends, evaluate needs, and create sustainable development to, uh, policies in the collective interest. Say, in uh, you have an Earth observation satellite used by Amnesty International to monitor ongoing human rights violations in Burma and throughout Africa as well. Indeed, satellites, in that sense, you also have the second extension, sorry, of uh, the intersection between human rights and outer space, where you have the extraterritorial extension of. Uh, international human rights law into outer space affairs 
And it is this second intersection which proves most relevant to our concerns regarding the potential, hum the potential for human colonies and human, um, hum uh, prolonged human existence in our space and upon other celestial bodies. And this comes from the acknowledgement that where technological advancements have all too often taken priority over the development of the law, the reckless advancement of humanity into space over the need for law and basic human rights poses an acute risk to the value and presence of human life in space and upon other celestial bodies. So while the commercialization of space presents significant opportunities to describe the democratization and access to outer space, it also presents unique ethical, moral challenges to humanity's prolonged habitation on the, on, the, on the moon, on Mars, and wherever else we may soon travel. The, the prioritization of commercial interests here over fundamental human rights and dignity in the control of extraction and use of natural resources integral to human survival on the moon and other celestial bodies will impede the realization of human health and well-being with significant implications for the survival and stability of human civilization in outer space. So going to this first point regarding space mining, the destructive nature and hyper capitalism tied to mining activities can give rise to noted impacts upon both the environment and upon human society. With it, on Earth, we can already see how certain mining companies, through the use of mercury and other associated chemicals in the mining process, can and the act of deforestation can cause unparalleled harm to the environment and leave an, un, an area toxic and uninhabitable. So human rights promote the, promote the exercise of the precautionary interval precautionary principle in this sense, and promotes the preservation of the outer space environment as a new international commons. Associated with this, we also have the, the area of space tourism, where you have people now who are uh, planning to travel soon. Uh, I think there was a Japanese, Japanese tourist was looking for a partner to travel around the moon in the, in the next decade, uh, funded by SpaceX. And the question here arises, what happens when you have a situation like Apollo 13 arise on the, on the space vehicle? How can the state fulfill the individual's rights to life under this circumstance? This raises concern over the possibility of mountain rescue effort, both from a technical, legal, and financial perspective as well. And then third, in the context of human colonization on the moon and across space, it's presented that the presence of human rights is conducive to ensuring <coughs> success and prosperity of human colonies. Reference may be had to the 2014 Extraterrestrial Liberty Conference where participants considered the possibility of a Bill of Rights in legislating and providing for a set governance structure uh, conducive to the survival and prosperity of the human colony on Mars in the near future. How accordingly relevant human rights values and principles in this context may include the right to health, concerning giving birth in space, cultural rights in relation to the preservation of space heritage sites and artifacts, the right to work and free choice of employment concerning labor issues as well, and the right to a fair trial and due process in instances of criminal, criminal justice. So just going over briefly the international human rights framework in the aftermath of the Second World War, we the international community, apprehensive to the horrors of the, the Holocaust and the occurrence of two world conflicts, collectively decided to promote and encourage respect for human rights through international cooperation. Under this contemporary IHRL framework, universal human rights have often been expressed and guaranteed in law, in the forms of treaties, customary international law, general principles, and other sources of international law. In extending these these international human rights agreements extraterritorially, that is beyond the borders of a state and into the domain of outer space reference may be had to several customary law developments. Firstly, you have a 1970 case called the Namibia Advisory Opinion, where it was held that the title of a state of a particular territory is not a prerequisite for the extraterritorial application of human rights law but that the state's physical control over that territory is sufficient in itself. 
And in addition to that, you have efforts made by civil society, such as the 2011 Maastricht principles on extraterritorial obligations of states, providing for the obligation of states to extend the observance and realization of IHRL values and principles extraterritorially. Looking to the international space law framework as well, it's evident that the contents here provides opportunities for the application of international human rights law into the domain of outer space. Consideration must be held to the geopolitical character though of the space race and to the Cold War, where during this period there were no private space companies and there was active competition between the US and USSR. Uh, the domain and the domain of outer space was dominated by two superpowers and national space agencies. Consequently, in bringing the domain of, in bringing IHRL into the outer space domain, requires a consideration of several provisions. Firstly, people usually look to Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, which talks about the activities being conducted by a state must be carried out in accordance with international law, including the UN Charter. In that sense, it requires governments and states to consider in what particular aspect does human rights extend to their outer space activities. Additional to that, the relevant body that oversees the application of space law agreements is the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, which serves as the Secretariat for the UN General Assembly's only committee dealing exclusively with international cooperation and peaceful use of outer space. The UN USA has acknowledged by implication the association between human rights and outer space affairs through the, their adherence to the objectives of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development also known as the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, providing the opportunity for governments and the international community to renew their commitment to improving the life and well-being of their citizens under the SDGs application in outer space context. So the benefits of human rights in space are multiple. Firstly, the right to own property is recognized under Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Regional human rights bodies also recognize this right, with Article 1 of Article 1 to the European Convention on Human Rights also referencing it. Number two, you also have maintaining the rule of law. Herein, the rule of law is relevant to issues of equality, non-discrimination, criminal justice and fairness. Third, supporting the transference of values and ethical principles relating to the preservation of cultural identity, including aspects of nationality, religion, and language. Fourth, you have safeguarding human dignity relevant in ensuring the provision of resources and services considered essential to human dignity, health, safety, and existence in outer space. Fifth, you also have reinforcing a common connection with terrestrial governments, ensuring similarity of values and principles between Earth and isolated human communities. Sixth, you have promoting sustainable practices and environmental responsibility in precluding and managing the challenges of space debris and space traffic management. And finally, the holding of local governments and authorities accountable helps to prevent abuses and provides recourse for countering injustices for vulnerable groups. So to meet the unique challenges associated with humanity's prolonged presence and activities across the expanse of space, there arises the need to advance development and adoption of new human rights values and principles. The most apparent means by which human rights comes into existence is as norms of national and international law created by enactment, custom, and judicial decisions. However, the basis of human rights may also be seen as founded in the idea that such rights and principles are rooted in deeper, uh, deeper areas of human morality and ethics. In considering the circumstances of human habitation in outer space, the resulting moral rights which arise feed into the need for the following three core rights. The advancement of these rights under the project here are premised upon the moral considerations of equality, autonomy, human dignity, fundamental human interests, the capacity for racial, rational agency and democracy. So concerning the rights of water, this right is actually already recognized within international law under the right to water and sanitation since 2010. 
this resolution, uh, UN resolution here specifically recognized the right, acknowledging that clean drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of associated human rights. The UN called for states and international organizations thereafter to provide financial resources, help capacity building, and technology transfer to help countries provide safe, clean, accessible, and affordable drinking water and sanitation for all. However, in the outer space environment, the application of this right must account for, say, the financial costs involved in transporting, recycling, and mining water within a lunar colony, where the existence of water within, say, deep craters on the moon has been speculated in extraction will ultimately, of course, come at a cost. Further, multiple uses of water beyond human consumption must also be considered, for example, its use as a rocket propellant. Further to that, you also have the right to a breathable atmosphere. In relation to this, the, the right to breathe clean air is currently being considered under international human rights law jurisprudence. This has been associated with the responsibility of governments to regulate human activities which have a pollutive impact upon the air, ranging from the use of cooking fuels across homes, across developing countries, to managing wide-scale pollution activities as seen within India and China. Within this context of outer space activities, though, the need for a right to breathable atmosphere is faced in such a way, given the acknowledgement that, say, oxygen may not prove as the best gas atmosphere for long-term human habitation. This is also associated with such risks, such as, say, oxygen toxicity, safety concerns, such as the potential for fires to occur, like in the Apollo 1 uh, mission, and within a pure oxygen environment. Additionally, the right to a breathable atmosphere here draws upon the need to consider composition of a breathable atmosphere to be provided, where you have, say, within the commercial diving industry, people who use a mix of nitrogen, helox, and trimix for long-term breathing. The right to breathable atmosphere also requires us, challenges the international community to consider the pressure of the breathable atmosphere within um, the enclosed habitat of space vehicle. So this is tied to the site and design of the space vehicle and habitat, along with the containers used to hold these gases. Finally, we have the right to a habitable environment, requiring states to adopt measures to ensure a safe, clean, and healthy environment. This is comprised of a number of substantive human rights, such as the right to health, the right to life, and the right to water. The right to a healthy environment is recognized as a legally enforceable human right across 181 UN member countries at the moment agreed to recognize this right through a mixture of treaties, constitutions, and legislative instruments. Within outer space environments, though, the need for a right to a habitable environment is faced as such given the inherently hazardous conditions and environments of outer space, and the acknowledgement that states may not adequately meet, meet, meet the comparable legal definition and standard of what is considered healthy in terrestrial terms. So in the enforcement of human rights in general and these novel rights, the means by which states' obligations have been enforced adheres to the idea of a tripartite tropology. This tropology outlines how states bear obligations in relation to human rights regarding, firstly, the negative, ob the negative obligation to avoid depriving or interfering with the enjoyment of human rights. Secondly, the positive obligation to prevent others from interfering with rights or depriving others from the enjoyment of such rights. And third, the positive obligation to aid the deprived by adopting appropriate measures toward the full realization of such rights. States thus bear the respective obligation of respect, protect, and fulfill in, re in regards to their human rights obligations. Furthermore, outlining the practicality of right to breathable atmosphere and associated human rights values being applied in outer space requires the consideration of an additional topology in that sense, known as the five A's. Herein, states must consider in the provision of social goods and services, the, the traits of availability, accessibility, adequacy, acceptability, 
and adaptability of that resource, be it oxygen, water, food, or otherwise. So where human rights can be considered in all circumstances and applied extraterritorially, the international human rights framework provides the ideal mechanism through which humanity can realize and enforce human rights on, in space and throughout other celestial bodies. The current international human rights world framework is premised upon these core, nine core instruments which are maintained and enforced under the authority of dedicated human bodies. The existing international human rights law system provides the most effective, coherent and immediate means for managing the challenges associated with respecting, protecting and fulfilling state obligations concerning human activities across the final frontier. Moving forward, therefore, it falls upon the concerted efforts of governments, uh, academia, uh, private companies and to the society to advance the cause of human rights in outer space and ensure good governance and the maintenance of international peace and stability. For to deny people their human rights is to deny their very, is to challenge their very humanity. So that marks the end of the presentation and I'll take questions. Yep. And I think we've got the microphone. Is that the big one there? Yeah, okay. So what law are applies on the International Space Station? Mm. So it comes under the international the ISS agreements between uh, between the parties there, where they've set out how uh, but that's mainly regulations dealing with how to uh, manage the, the station with regards to say elements such as criminal law and human rights law, IP law and so forth. It depends on the particular space vehicle, section of the space vehicle. So if you're in the Russian capsule, Russian law applies, Jap Japanese capsule, Jap Japanese law applies and so forth. There was a, a case a couple of years ago, one of the astronauts on the ISS was being sued or, or trying to access funds from their oh, yes, the security case. Yeah, that's fine. I, I remember that case had a, a female astronaut who attempted to uh, withdraw funds from a joint, a joint bank account with her partner on Earth illicitly. Uh, that case didn't proceed to court, though, however, it was settled out of court. So, uh, but if, if it had gone to court, how it might have been solved in that case would be uh, you have. You have to look into what particular caps, uh, what particular capsule the, the astronaut was in when they accessed the system, and what, <laughs> yeah. So if it was the U.S. capsule, then the U.S. law might apply. And then with regards as well, you have certain U.S. laws that apply uh, extraterritorially, so long arm jurisdiction. So in the case of U.S. laws, uh, they do have certain computer uh, wire wire fraud and computer and cyber security laws which apply extraterritorially, that's how they were able to, say, charge Julian Assange of the espionage and so forth. So an astronaut might do an action that's illegal in one part of the space station and legal in another part of the space station. Yeah, that would be a possibility. But of course, well, I think all legal systems have the general provision not to kill anyone, so uh, yeah. you have to be pretty uh, fair. So one portion of the space station might be a tax haven or something like that? Theoretically, yes. <laughs> so if you were mining Bitcoin there, for example, yeah. Uh, so John, what's the objective of your project? Is it to come up with a, a general policy and legal structure that hopefully governments will adopt for their, their, their offer activities? Is that what you're aiming to do? Yeah, so to devise a declaration in that sense through which governments and private space companies may first indicate their, their, uh, their willingness to address basic human rights issues in outer space. But also from that, to just develop existing human rights values as adapted to the outer space context. And to consider these um, three, um, the right to be the atmosphere, the right to water, and the right to a habitable environment within the outer space context as well. Yeah. We know from 2020 that uh, human rights can be subordinate to other things like public health and safety. And I also know things like national security 
Mm. So why begin with human rights in space, given that we have 200 different interpretations of it on Earth, and 200 nation states, and while everybody may have some form of universal agreement, there's no universal enforcement or policing or observance of human rights on Earth. So why take that into space as your first thing when we should be focusing on things like uh, jurisdictional responsibility, um, like is the captain of the ship the one who's in charge of the law? Um, is, is Antarctica a model for how this works? What's the law in Antarctica? So why start with human rights when there are more fundamental things to do? If, if um, public health and safety are important on Earth, how much more important are public health and safety going to be in space? Mm. Yeah, so definitely it ties to that element of protecting the individual's health, well-being, safety and dignity. And the need for human rights in space is premised upon this idea, this idea that uh, human health and dignity are fundamental elements which must be first considered in any regard for, for when creating a legal system, when creating a, an ethical, moral and uh, principled basis for how you engage with others in outer space, not just within um, set jurisdictions, but also within um, outside of any jurisdiction. So if you were in, on a, another planet, for example, and you're looking for a commonality to draw between yourself and the person from Russia, for example. Obviously, there's going to be disagreements as to whether you apply Russian law or apply American law, but since given that human rights law has been widely accepted by both the United Nations and national governments all around the world, it provides the most conducive standard to um, engage yeah, in. Which is just a bit nebulous. What if a, a mission commander or a habitat commander says, all this is going to have to do without the right of X, Y, and Z mm. in order to survive the next so many days, weeks, mm. or months. We're just going to have to put that on hold. Yeah. But surely that becomes subordinate to public safety. Yeah, so the way that the human rights system works is that you have certain rights which are absolute and non derogable and certain rights which you can derogate from in instances of national emergency and national security. In under the ICCPR, you have, say, the right to, the right to life, the right to um, protection from torture being as non-derogable absolute right. Under no circumstances can a state or um, um, any authority de delegate from following that, those specified rights. However, that, that instance only applies to, to, the, to political rights. When you go look at the economic, social, and cultural rights under the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, there, there is no set uh, absolute non derogable rights. That's why the, the right to water had such a difficult time being um, recognized widely within international law and being enforced as well by national governments. They have yet to recognize this as a non derogable absolute right. Yep. Wouldn't, uh, by the very nature of someone doing a mission, but let's, let's say Mars 1, would they, first thing they'd sign is a waiver from all those rights because if they want to go on the mission, they'll do whatever the hell they They'll sign with it and give away whatever they need to be on it. Yeah, sure. I mean, you always have people asking about contracts where it says that it excludes them from this act, this particular law, and so forth. However, you have overarching laws already in place, national laws, such as um, saying signing a contract in dealing cocaine doesn't exclude you from the criminal act. And in that sense, the, the same thing will apply in the human rights uh, context as well. So I know I read somewhere, like, yeah, when you go skiing and there's a little thing about you accept all the things, that that's meaningless. To a, like, certain, to a certain extent, yes. Unless they put the right goal in there. In. Yeah. In. Absolutely. Any other questions? In the case of vehicles travelling in space, isn't it just an extension of maritime law where the captain or the commander is the Body of war for that particular vessel. 
in that sense, yes, you could say that maritime law does apply through the Outer Space Treaty. And where are we going with this again? Well, just if you've got a, a habitat on the moon or whatever, and somebody breaks the law, isn't the the uh, the administrator or the commander of the base isn't he like the legal officer of the place? The mm. Potentially, yes, but it still doesn't supersede um, human rights in that sense as well. So my human right is I want to go outside the habitat. I want to go run around outside. That's the not it. says, no, that's dangerous. Yeah. Who wins? Yeah, so to go outside the habitat, so freedom of navigation, freedom of movement, that is not a non-derogable absolute human right. And in that sense, the, the commander can exercise his, his right to override it, um, given the circumstances. It must be qualified, though, um, according to what is, um, what's the situation on ground, what is considered just, and what the, the law says, uh, in, interpretation-wise, as well. Um, last question, maybe. Yeah. The Artemis Accord, does that take into account any of the things that you're looking at or mm. interested in, or is it yeah. about who's got the right to dig a hole? <laughs> yeah, there, there are several uh, aspects of the Artemis Accords that does elicit human rights, uh, human rights values and principles. So, for example, you had the, the right to, um, within the, the courts they were referencing the protection of historical and cultural artifacts and sites, such as the Apollo moon landing uh, site. And that applies to the rights to, say, participation within cultural life and the general rights, also the general need as well to protect uh, cultural, cultural artifacts and sites as, um, as associated with that right to participate in cultural and uh, cultural life. And then, oh yeah, that also reminds me, I did us, so if you're interested in that, have a read on the website. We did write an article about the artist Court specifically. And then another interesting point that's um, tied to the artist records was the creation of uh, space protection zones, space, uh, <laughs> space exclusion zones, I guess that's right. And yeah, so quite interesting. I just wrote another article regarding China's uh, Chang'e 5 mission to the moon and how the, the decision of the mission to pass a national Chinese flag on the moon opened the way to uh, undercut US plans to set up space exclusion zones and creating their own space exclusion zones. Given that the Chinese national flag is inherently tied to issues of national security in China under law and has been, uh, and the desecration of the flag has been pursued as well extraterritorially, uh, both in, in the UK where you, yep. The one last question. In China, we will extend the railroad to the Apollo 11 landing site. Yes, they can. Uh, that might upset a lot of Americans, but uh, technically they can. And they can. Um, they're not violating any international law. No, they're not. Because uh, space, is, space is recognized, like you said, like uh, in the case of maritime law, it's uh, freedom of navigation and the ability to travel where you want at the moment. However, um, since you already, if you look at the accord, you already have a bunch of states signing up. So there's the possibility that um, the space exclusion zones may become a part of customary international law over time if it's enforced uh, continuously. So I think the laws that were passed were for a US company to yeah. Yeah. start on that. Well, thank you, Jonathan. If there's anyone on Zoom that has a question, you can ask it now. You're allowed to unmute. Hello. Well, if they, don't, they can write a question in if they want to. Thanks, Jonathan. Really appreciate you coming along tonight. No it's been fantastic. Um, please accept the Space Association pin from us. We're with Pride and. Um, we're going to take a break now, and uh, oh, thanks. Sorry? Oh, he's got a question. Oh. Is he going to speak or is he dead? Hello? Sorry, Mr. Lim? Yep, hello. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me too well. I 
put it this way, sometimes the uh, the voice is a bit garbled. But can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for your conversation and your presentation, right? Um, my feeling is that a lot of the uh, details and the, uh, you know, the specifications of tonight are something that we should already have incorporated here on Earth, okay? So how is the perspective of these, uh, you know, call it uh, stipulations and details about human um, integrities and human safeguards, how is this going to be taken up on, on, on the space stations, on uh, moon bases and other space missions, right? And who is going to be the provider of all these uh, parameters like you know, provision of water, provision of uh, safety, provision of resources, right? Who, where are the stipulations of who are going to be responsible for those parameters or those uh, efforts? And who are going to be the arbiters should anything come into question, please? Indeed. So when you look at the current international human rights law framework, the way that it works is that you have obviously the, the nine core human rights treaty, but then under each of these treaties as well, you have an administrative body, such as a, a committee that's within the UN that manages uh, compliance, monitoring, and supervision of how countries, member states who have signed up to agree to each of these human rights have, have performed over time. And while states have yet to fully consider how human rights uh, applies within the outer space context, the, the point remains that, that it's there and it's, it's contingent upon states to, to work to extol how human rights apply. And over time, I, I foresee that as space becomes more democratized, except for virtualized, when you have more and more ordinary people go up to state, uh, to outer space, that is when you will have more legal actions and more um, arbitration going on with regards to people having their human rights violated. They can report it to their national human rights bodies, which therefore, uh, and, and then to the human rights, specific human rights rapporteurs as well. And it feeds up the chain there straight to um, it keeps going further up, and that requires, however, that the the person exhausts all domestic options for judicial uh, recourse regarding their human rights violation before proceeding to regional human rights bodies and then uh, thereafter to the ICJ. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to take a 15 minute break now um, and we'll be back with Global Space News with Angelo Bugazia. Um, if you've got any more questions, you can write them in the chat box here and we'll see if we can get to them later on perhaps. Um, thanks for all uh, we'll the uh, I mute anything here or turn the mic off? Mic off?
Hi, Ron. I've unmuted you all, so feel free to talk amongst yourself. Awesome. Thank you. What's been happening, Charlie? Not much, Rob. I'm, I'm just wondering how many kind people are at the meeting overall. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Happy to see you too, Julian. Right? Thank you. Yeah, mate, right? It's amazing how time flies. Yeah, we're at the end of January already. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, but at least we're not at the end of COVID. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. I think that's going to take another year or two, I reckon. Then it's running according to the uh, program of the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you had, the, you had these uh, dramatic um, re reoccurrences, so, so to speak, back then, right? Um, there was a shipload of immigrants leaving war-torn Europe at the time. <laughs> You know, obviously things take a while to readjust and the devastation's hard to get over. But there was a shipload of immigrants leaving war-torn Europe sometime in the early 1920s. And they incurred uh, Spanish flu on board, right? The ship yeah. was coming to Australia. It was, uh, I think, meant to dock in, at, uh, in Sydney. And uh, the Australian authorities wouldn't allow them to, to dock in, right? Yeah. This caused a huge humanitarian outburst, you know. So who's responsible? What can they do? How can they relieve the situation? And eventually, little old New Zealand said, okay, we feel sorry for them, so we'll take them on board and we'll uh, put them onto some of our islands uh, just off the island of the city of Auckland in, in the bay there, right? Yeah. And, um, subsequently, 20,000 New Zealanders died, right? Yeah. So... Uh, these are the experience that we have, right? Well, yeah, the restrictions that we've got, et etc. Et so we've still got a lot to learn and uh, a lot to improve and have international agreements about all this. Right? Yeah, but I, I think a good thing about putting all these international uh, agreements in place is, um, I mean, they will get amended as increase in population going into space. Uh, yeah. They'll they'll change it as they move it along, but at least we've got they've got something in place um, before space tourism etc cetera, etc cetera, takes off. Okay. I guess that's what I, I guess that's why they're going down to all this nitty grittiness, um, because I reckon as soon as you start getting permanent settlement on the moon, mm -hmm. um, I reckon it will just majorly snowball. Good point. Okay. I'm only saying that is because currently with my work, we're still in the commissioning phase yeah. and I'm having to draft up all these safety policies and plans and procedures um, because when we do become fully operational, we've got to have all that in place. Um, once, once it's operational, we can then amend uh, the existing versions. Um, but yeah, I don't think they'll let you move forward unless you've got all this framework in place. Okay, but you need a police force as well, somewhat. Yeah. Well, no, no, hey, Amer America's got Space Force. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, you <okay>. can. <laughs> Trump's got a Space Force, but he, uh, he reckons he had a health plan, a good health plan, coming out in two weeks, in two weeks, in two weeks. And turns yeah. out he didn't even have a, a vaccine uh, distribution plan. Uh, process uh, in the offing no, no. either, right? No. So, it's, uh, uh, yeah, people say things, but, uh, yeah, you, you exactly. want to find back up as well, you know? Yeah, and um, I guess we can only look at our history and, and, like, if a lot of these accords, from what I understand, are all by the UN yeah. signed. Yeah. Um, I remember the, the UN... Um, UN forces were huge when there were some conflicts happening in the Middle East. Yeah. 
So who knows, maybe they might put a space segment on in order to police it. Okay, right. And uh, when we go to the moon, right, who's going yeah. to care if someone's Chinese or if someone's uh, European or someone's American or Australian? You know, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all of us, really, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Mm. Yeah. It, it's wow. certainly um, a, a bit of a Pandora's box, I reckon. Yeah, right. So, uh, you yeah. know. We can do a lot here on Earth, but basically, you know, there seems to be a bit of a gap in the space interest because of circumstances. Um, Australia is fledgling at the best, right? Uh, but there's nothing much in South America except for uh, French Guiana, right? Yeah. Probably nothing in Africa. So that's a whole sector of uh, likely comms links and other. Um, yeah, agreement links that are basically uh, void or uh, mm. non-existent. So we're getting there, but we're not exactly brimming with um, you know, deep interest yet. You know? No, exactly. Mm. But uh, from what it looks like is you've got to have something in place rather than have nothing in place. Yeah, good point, good point, yeah. Right. So, otherwise you've got nothing to work off. So, yeah. yeah. But I reckon, I reckon it will snowball. As soon as, as soon as they put something up on the moon, mm -hmm. I, I reckon, I reckon it will snowball big time. Yeah, okay. But, um, I don't know how many other people at the, at the gathering tonight feel mm. the same way as I do in regard that we, as the extensive human community, really didn't want to go to the moon in the first place, right? Mm. And basically two vested interests basically said, we're going to beat each other. They conjure up a few connections with other, you know, um, capable uh, groups like uh, you know, rocket builders or rocket suppliers or other, uh, you know, slightly interested government agencies and we got to mm. the moon, right so the u.s got there before the russians blah blah and we went there for three years and then now we might return in the next 50 right yeah so obviously we didn't want to go to the moon in the first place right so if we yeah. go back to the moon with the same attitude right collective and also international right then we're really not putting our cars on the table right it's really going to be hodgepodge, right? So oh. what we need is somehow the rest of the community to find it's worthwhile for the, you know, the general human uh, you know, capability of what we've got, what our destiny is, right? And say oh. Mars, right? We'll get to Mars, but we've got to get there with the right motivations and the right commitment. You're not just, oh, look, oh, we want to beat the New Zealanders, you know. Mm. As Andrew Rennie has bragging rights. That's what I think. All these things are... Uh, yeah. A bit but, I, I, emotions, you know? but I remember last time um, we had a virtual meeting mm. and I forgot the gentleman's name. He was doing all the, the Russian cosmonaut side of things. Oh, yeah? Uh, e Eagle, wasn't it? Eagle. Um, Eagle. Yeah, um, of you know the way the Russians are already advanced in building stuff, and I asked them if it was a repeat of the of the space race, and I remember him saying, "No, no, we're just going to be a space taxi." <laughs> so, so I think the whole motivation or the whole goal of going to the moon now is totally different. Hopefully, right, and uh, you know, how many other nations are interested? How many other mm. nations are capable of being interested, depending on their local economic circumstances, right, you know? That's right. Yeah. So, going, going to the moon by Western concerns, right, is not exactly the full deal if... China can't get there, or if Russia can't get there, or if India or Japan can't get there. 
right? Yeah. Basically, you know, all of us should be, should feel like we've got an opportunity to, to do so. Yeah. yeah, but I think I think now it's going to become more of a commercial race yeah, than a than a than a military race. But basically, he might say it's commercial, right? Mm. But then after a while, as you say, colonization, etc., et you know, it it gets out of the economics, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Now, a number of things can happen, and really we've got the economic prospects maybe even the capacity to go to the moon right and set up mm -hmm. a moon base keep the international space station etc etc all we have to agree on internationally is that every nation in the world reduces by 10 percent reduces their defense budgets yeah and then we've got the money Right. We've got the money for climate change, we've got the money for the environment, we've got the money for the space program, right? Yeah. Yeah, but you know. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, but it's not as if we're um, out of the picture completely, right? Yeah. The international uh, defence budget total, right, can be re-accommodated and uh, that way do a bit better on the space programs in general yeah yeah but history has shown us that any advancement in technology is always first of all in in, in the, the best interests of the military yeah, okay but you, you imagine if the us obviously when they go to the moon or australia when it goes to the moon new zealand when it goes to the moon all this right you imagine that some of their payload that they have to have to establish up there is they have to take uh, weaponry, okay? Mm. To guard their security, right? So yeah. each nation that does that goes to the moon wherever they are and they finally set up a base, right? How much of the yearly uh, you know, campaign or yearly program to establish their bases on the moon has a weaponry component to it, right? Yeah. So in other words, you know, the West Australians take their weapons, the Victorians take their weapons, all of a sudden, that's effectively uh, rather useless weight, isn't it? Uh -huh. right. So you got to look after that too. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Ron, uh, I'm about to meet you all again. Uh, okay. I'll get started. No worries. I'm going to put my video off because I've got an awesome spaghetti here. Oh, I should. I'm jealous. Yeah. Thing, one, two, three. Right, <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Uh -huh. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just say when you're ready, Ash. You ready to go? Okay. okay. All right, talk. Say something. Okay, testing. One, two, three, four. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Um, I do tend to talk a little loud, so if you need to turn it down a bit, Ash, you're in charge. Um, welcome to 2021. God, I didn't think I'd get here, but I am. But I have. And... Um, if you thought last year was a big year in space, this year is going to be a real woozy. Huh? Yeah. We okay? Yep. Okay. So let's begin. Begin at the beginning. And of course, nothing happens. Australian space. Um, that was touched on a little, a little bit before, but uh, I'll, uh, I've got a couple of other aspects. The Australian Space Agency, uh, the ASA was established in 2018, as you know, and continues to be pretty proactive in, and uh, with objectives to triple the size of Australia's space industry by 2030. So uh, my personal view of the, their performance so far, I'd give them a you know, good eight, eight out of 10. I think they're doing really good as a coordinating body. Sorry, Ash, we've got our favorite uh, thing here. 
That's okay, I'll get rid of it. That's okay, it'll work. Moving on. In October 2020, Australia became one of the first signatories to NASA's Artemis Accords, uh, which established a set of principles to guide space exploration cooperation uh, with the stated aim to return to the moon by 2024. Now, 2024, now that Mr. Trump is uh, in, living in Florida, is probably no longer going to happen, even if Trump was still in power. That, that, <laughs> that 2020, no conspiracy the theories here tonight, please. But 2024 was never going to work. But more than likely, 2028 is a more realistic figure that you can aim for. Uh, the Artis, Artemis Accords reaffirm the signatory's commitment to the Outer Space uh, Treaty of 1967. Uh, now, at the end of 2020, the ASA announced that uh, Enrico Palermo, uh, who was the Chief Operating Officer of Virgin Galactic, would be taking over from Dr. Megan Clark as head of the ASA, effective January uh, 2021. And Dr. Clark would be taking the role as Chair of the ASA Advisory Board. So that's actually happened. So um, that's good. And uh, he's, a, he's a young engineer, mechanical engineer from Western Australia who went overseas and did some good there and now hopefully he'll come back. He's uh, young and enthusiastic and ready to go. So that's good. The other not notable um, events, recent events, these are just highlights. This is not everything that's happened in the last few months because it's just too much to cover. But Gilmore Space, um, Gilmore Space is Gold Coast based. He set a uh, world record for a hybrid rockets when it successfully hot fired the world's largest single port hybrid. Now I'm guessing it's some sort of rubber and nitrous oxide as the uh, uh, oxidizer rocket engine. So uh, that's pretty good. He's been working on it for some years and uh, finally it's coming to fruition. It achieved a record of 91 kilonewtons or nine tons of uh, force thrust in the initial verification test of its uh, proprietary main engine and which will power the first and second stages of the Keras orbital orbital vehicle. And they um, reported the system performed very well in a 10 second burn. Uh, now, Gilmore plans to start launching uh, within 100, 1,000 kilometers orbits from next year. Side note, the South Australian government uh, also announced plans to launch its own satellite in low Earth orbit. It'll be the first Australian state to do that. So I think we should go um, out a bit of a mission for having Victoria do the same. Uh, you'll see on the left hand side, you'll see the Eris rocket and you'll see the test uh, and um, you'll see the, the uh, personnel that currently are working with Gilmore. So we wish him and the team all the success possible. Electron, our neighbour, across the ditch, uh, have been going great guns. They launch from the north east coast of New Zealand. Love to get there one day, but I believe there's not many roads that lead into the rocket site. Should talk to Andrew, maybe he knows a bit more later. Um, so Rocket Lab, Rocket Lab launched this year, a microsatellite into uh, orbit on its first mission. Another one leaves the crust on the 20th of January. A lot of these things have just happened recently. That payload, a communication satellite for the European Space Technology Company, OHB, was successfully deployed about 70 minutes after liftoff. It was the 18th mission overall of the Electron, which has been providing dedicated rights for small satellites since 2018. Uh, the rocket has now lofted uh, a total of 97 spacecraft in orbit, which is a pretty, pretty significant achievement. It's an expendable rocket. However, uh, Rocket Lab intends to reuse Electron's first stage which will be plucked out of the sky with a helicopter as they're returning to Earth. So um, all Rocket uh, Lab's missions to date have launched from the company's New Zealand site, but it recently built a second site at uh, Wallops Island, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia, USA, mainly to accommodate the small satellite missions for the US government. So the first electron is expected to fly from Virginia in the first half of 2021. Uh, that's uh, another one leaves the crust on a few days back. And uh, 
the, the picture on the top left hand corner was a experimental dummy, but uh, I think the one below was the mission that was launched in November, December uh, of um, last year. And uh, it actually ditched into the ocean uh, and they picked it up from there to validate uh, the success of the re-entry basically because the engines come down first. And you'll see that there's a profile here of how this thing works. Okay, moving on. Now we go to NASA, space policy. Moonrock, at the request of uh, President Joe, Joe Biden, sounds a little bit different. Uh, a moon rock is now on display in the Oval Office. Lunar sample, there's the number, is a remnant from a violent asteroid impact on the moon's surface and it was brought back during the Apollo 17 mission. It was uh, reported that Biden selected the lunar sample to remind Americans of the ambition and accomplishments of earlier generations. So that's a good thing, especially when it comes time to commit money to NASA. The sample is on loan from uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. And there it is sitting in the mantelpiece there. And this is what it looks like in the Oval Office. You'll see on the right hand side, the moon rock sits right next to his desk. Still the deplorables, the storm and whiteout. Uh, the deplorables. What was it? The hillbilly revolution? <laughs> uh, the US Space Council. Uh, various industry and space reps have asked the Biden administration to retain the Space Council. Um, it was chaired by former Vice President Pence. Uh, it was very success successful in facilitating the formulation and implementation of space policy and coordinating the space activities of the various government agencies, industry and other space related organisations. At the moment, no decision has been made. If precedence was to remain the same, Kamala Harris would become the chair of the, uh, of the Space Council. And I'm afraid I don't know that Kamala has got a lot of space credentials. So it won't be the same as Pence. Pence had a bit of a passion. In my re-election thing last oh, yeah. I, I hope you're right, but, but if they keep the Space Council, she'll become the chair. So hopefully she uh, knows uh, a little bit about space and, and supports the, uh, uh, the, the uh, space missions. Okay, well done, Jim Bridenstine. Yeah. They are. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine uh, he wasn't part of the conspiracy theory because he basically uh, made made known after the election in December, in November, sorry, that uh, you know Biden looked like it would he would win, and therefore he was going to resign effective uh, of the 20th of January, which was inauguration day. So poor old Jim is no longer the uh, NASA administrator. His nomination in 2017 and his appointment in April 2018 was controversial because he was a Republican uh, congressman from Oklahoma. Now, me for one, you know, I it took from 2017 to 2018 to get him uh, across the across the line. Uh, and I thought, oh no, we don't want another party hack. That's the last person we want. Well, let me tell you, me and a lot of other people have been amazingly surprised by his performance. He served for just under three years, but in that time change, the perception of and the way NASA does business. Um, he has surprised. Um, the way he, he can work the numbers, the way he's worked with the both sides of the house, the way of trying to, I'll, I'll come to some of those in a sec. He was someone with a genuine passion for space exploration and its value to the public. Um, so, you know, and, and he was very knowledgeable. I mean, he has an Air Force background, but he was most knowledgeable. And where it came across, if you remember the Green Run test, which I'll talk about shortly, one of the uh, NASA administrators was talking about what was going on and, and Biden, uh, Biden, sorry, Bridenstine was sitting next to him and would correct him on the detail that the manager should have been aware of. So I, I found him a breath of fresh air, to be honest. Um, Above all, he tried to form a bipartisan approach to NASA and space exploration. Uh, it's worth listening to it. I, I thought it was good, but uh, he's trying to keep the Artemis project going. 
I just want to take a minute and thank the entire NASA workforce and the entire American space industry, in fact, for the amazing experience that I have had here as the NASA administrator. You know, I think it's really important as we move forward as an agency that we think about what enables success. And I'll tell you what we've been working on since I've been here is eliminating divisions. And, and if we eliminate divisions and we can get the, the bipartisan, apolitical consensus with commercial partners and international partners, I think it sets us up in a great position to move forward in a meaningful way that crosses not just multiple administrations, but multi-decades and, in fact, multi-generations. And, and really, that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to say, look, it's not about the moon or Mars, which put us uh, in, in conflict in the House of Representatives between Republicans and Democrats. It's about both. It's about going to the moon to get the science and discovery that we need to learn how to live and work on, an, on another world for long periods of time so that we can go to Mars. It's about the moon and Mars. It's the moon to Mars program. And of course, we, we, we solidified that with the Artemis program. It's not about human exploration or, or robotic exploration. It's about both. It's not about the human exploration mission directorate or the science mission directorate. It's about both. It's about working together in a transdisciplinary way. And of course, the teams at NASA have, have really come together and, and made that happen. Uh, when we think about um, the different types of contracting, it's not about you know, new space or traditional space or new ways of contracting or old ways of contracting. The reality is we need different mechanisms to ser serve different purposes. And when we think about the Artemis program, I think we have brought all of the industry together with government and our international partners to say that, look, we can go to the moon where everybody benefits, humanity benefits, and create a sustainable program for the future. So I just want to say to everybody what an amazing experience it has been. Uh, this was, this was a, you know, a, a, a job of a lifetime. I don't know how I will ever match it again for all of my years. Uh, but, but I will tell you, um, the amazing people at NASA, uh, you can't be replaced. You're the best. And uh, I'm just so grateful uh, for all of the, the great experiences, the hard times, but also the great accomplishments and the things that we were able to achieve together. So with that, I say farewell. Um, and I'll tell you, um, when a new team comes in, uh, give them all your support because they need it, they deserve it. And, uh, and of course, what we're trying to do, again, we're not only crossing multiple administrations, but multi-decade and multi-generational. So uh, again, they'll have all my support, and I hope they have all your support. Uh, so go get them. Go NASA at Astra. So there you go. No, he's very good. He's, uh, uh, because he's a he he's a Republican. He but yeah, there were a lot of people trying to keep him on, but decision had been made. And uh, anyway, well done, Jim Bridenstine. The highlights so I can go through commercial crew, the art and this generation. He coined some of these phrases: Moon and Mars Initiative, Clips, HLS, and Sustainable Return of the Moon. If it had a if it wasn't for him, half this stuff wouldn't wouldn't have happened. Uh, Moon 2024, uh, that was uh, really imposed by the Trump administration. Uh, Bridenstine all, always knew it wasn't going to be met, but he went along with it and pushed hard for it. The focus on climate change, despite the Trump administration's uh, basically rejecting climate change, it kept NASA uh, moving in that direction. And uh, how he did it is... I don't know, but he did. He uh, came in as a climate skeptic. He did. And he was going to follow Trump's wish to kill climate. Yeah, but he, he kept it going. So uh, the science continued. Uh, he'd led NASA through a pandemic, so often you'd see him working from home. Uh, he brought together a bipartisan and long-term approach to NASA and space. Again, he tried to uh, future-proof NASA, so any program you know, couldn't just be cut every four years easily. He, he established international uh, commitments, which saved the space station, if you remember back in the 90s. Um, he engaged with industry and uh, international players, inclusive, first woman and next man. He kind of popularised that phrase. Spoke on behalf of NASA and the common good, 
was very, very knowledgeable, articulate, as you saw, highly intelligent, had a vision. Uh, he reintroduced the worm logo. Yeah. So yeah. there you have it. Those who love it or hate it, <laughs> his yeah. motivations were honourable. And, uh, you know, I, um, farewell, Jim. Uh, you did good and he will be, be missed and uh, at Astra. But what's happened since is the new Biden, the new NASA administrator uh, appointed Steve uh, Jersick as acting NASA administrator. Jersick has been uh, the agency's associate administrator since 2018, but he's worked with NASA since 1988. So he's, uh, he's a long time NASA man. Um, he's one of 34 acting leaders that uh, was announced by Biden um, and the vice president uh, hours after the inauguration. So we wish him luck. But interestingly enough, uh, there's a bit of speculation that maybe the next NASA administrator is a woman. And some of the names there, some I know, some I don't. Uh, but pa Pam Malroy, of course, who has a, some association with some of the uh, companies like Gilmore Space and others in, uh, in, in Australia. And Kathy Lauders, uh, she's head of the manned space uh, space flight at the moment, so it'd be good, be good for NASA. Space program direction, the direction that NASA will take under the Biden uh, administration remains uncertain. The 2024 20, date, first woman, next man on the moon appears unlikely, and 28, as I said before, is more likely, 2028. Now we go into commercial resupply one. You all know that SpaceX and Northrop Grumman uh, got those gigs, and uh, I think they, they've come to an end. I'm not 100% sure, but we're now truly into commercial resupply services number two. And with that, you'll see that you've got the um, cargo Dragon, Dragon 2. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got Dream Chaser, which is being developed, and you've got um, uh, the orbital, uh, well, it's not orbital ATK anymore, it's Northrop Grumman with their Cygnus uh, spacecraft. CRS-21, 6th of December, was launched, and there it is, and it came back recently. It carried a, an interesting little docking mechanism, you might have observed. It's at the bottom of the trunk there, and uh, it sort of attaches to the docking point. You put stuff in it, and then you deattach de it, and you uh, expose the components within it into outer space. And of course, we've got Dream Chaser, Tenacity, coming, coming up shortly. Uh, it'll be launched, th there it is, and there's bits of it uh, being built. And the picture on the bottom is the um, Shooting Star, which is their uh, trunk, for want of a better word. And it'll be launched on the new Vulcan rocket, which ULA are currently building, or if they have to, they'll go back to the Atlas. Commercial crew program, Boeing Starliner, and SpaceX Crew Dragon. I'll start off with Boeing first. This CST-100 Starliner, they keep commercial crew Boeing launches. They did OFT-1, if you recall, back in uh, December, and it was cut Wasn't short. WFC? Hey? Wasn't it WFC? WFC? Anyway, bottom line was big software glitches. March 2021, they're going to be launching OF2, OFT2, and that is um, a repeat. This time, hopefully, everything works. Um, late in 2021, you'll get the first crew Starliner. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Early 2022 second operational mission to ISS. So they've got a long way to go. There it is, it can hold up to seven crew, but I think NASA only dictates a maximum of four with uh, space allocated for cargo. Uh, there it is again in its breakdown form. Uh, so what went wrong? Uh, no full buck, this came as a surprise, but they did no full up integrated test uh, was undertaken prior to launch. 
So in other words, they didn't put everything together and tried to run it together. They tested all subsystems, said, yeah, this is all good. This works terrific. And that's uh, how they launched, which is really bizarre for a company like Boeing. An issue with the spacecraft's mission elapsed timer, clock, software occurred 31 minutes into the flight. It was some 11 hours out of sync. Uh, due to intermittent space to ground communications issues, the controllers couldn't correct the problem either. So they had a sort of a double whammy. This anomaly caused a spacecraft to burn into an incorrect orbit, preventing rendezvous with the International Space Station. In trying to get into the orbit, it basically burned all its fuel, so it couldn't really maneuver any further. But there was another software glitch, which was even more worrisome. It was uh, the uh, the mechanism or the software that would release the uh, a service module from the uh, from the spacecraft. Um, had the engineers not picked up, uh, it would have pushed the two together somehow, and it could have been a catastrophic end uh, of the mission. But they found it and corrected the problem before re-entry. Uh, so the mission was reduced to just two days. Uh, subsequent NASA reviews identified 80, 80 corrective actions. In April 2020, Boeing announced, uh, probably with a little bit of backward pressure from NASA, that it would carry out uh, another orbital test flight at no cost to NASA. A few days ago, Boeing passed the big spacecraft software test. You know, a million lines of code had to be basically verified. Now, hopefully this time they'll do some integrated tests. Launch is expected in March, so we, we cross our fingers. There it is. So obviously there was a few hands up approach from NASA. It was. They blamed themselves somewhat for not having enough oversight over that, that particular product. And so they've learned some lessons, but I hope Boeing have, uh, because they need to learn them. Oh, by the way, what, is that called last thing sitting on the last thing or the bar? Inside is quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, my objective opinion is that uh, Dragon is better, but hey, who am I to give objective assessments? <laughs> and there it is. Uh, this was the uh, 20th December 20. That was the launch. And there it goes. And it came back at night. And you could see it drop, uh, drop its heat shield because airbags deploy just before it hits the ground, and then they cover it up. Uh, what was the reason they cover this thing up? Uh, so the, uh, it doesn't get damaged because they're going to reuse it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought it was to keep it warm in the New Mexico desert. Now we go to SpaceX. They read a different story. I am. <laughs> uh, they got the runs on the board. Boeing haven't. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the 2nd of March 2019, uh, Demo 1 launched. Very successful mission, extremely successful. Then we had the in flight abort, very spectacular, another successful demonstration. It's unmotive and most unmotive objective. Totally objective, you can be guaranteed of that. Then we had DM2, uh, where we had Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. Uh, they were going to have a seven day mission, but it turned out that they ended up having a quite an extended mission to August to the ISS. And then uh, last year, we had uh, what's now become Crew-1, used to be called US Crew Vehicle-1, but it's now just called Crew-1 on a six month mission. And in May 2021, this year, we're gonna have Crew-2 on a six month mission. So that's fantastic. And there's Demo-1. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you this, but the Boeing CST-100 has, see how you've got the little cap that comes, that opens up uh, when you're in orbit? Uh, the docking. Oh, over the docking, to, to protect the docking winter. Uh, Boeing and the CST-100 now has the same. Maybe that was part of the corrective action, protect your docking system, and they had it. There's the uh, in-flight abort, fantastic. And, there's Bob and Doug, and there's crew crew one, Walker, Glover, Hopkins and Nagui, and there's crew one, crew one, this is crew two. We've got one ESA representative, 
and one Jackson representative. And that's that's uh, Andy Johnson's wife. Yeah. No, no, Doug, Doug Hurley's wife. Doug Hurley. Oh, Shannon Walker. 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 Put it back a slide. Oh, is he up there now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. So I okay, now let's talk about Artemis. There it is. That's an artist's impression of the of the uh, block one SLS. That'll be Artemis one. You can see that there's a. We'll go from the left. Block one will be the first, but they intend to have the block one B. The block. The difference between the two is that uh, the upper stage for the one B has. Uh, the exploration alpha stage which, with four engines in it, and it can get uh, get to the moon uh, comfortably. Block one will be the first mission, however. There it is, Orion. NASA cuts short uh, its first now. What's happened over uh, recent times has been the Green Run test. It cut short its hot fire test of its massive uh, uh, SLS, the moon rocket core stage. The long awaited Green Run was held on the 16th of Jan. Uh, at test stand B2 at Stennis in Mississippi. The test was supposed to run for eight minutes. It's got four RS-25, which uh, shuttle heritage engines. They are actually, uh, have, had flown, most of them had flown on the last shuttle mission, STS-135. Uh, but uh, supposed to last eight minutes, only lasted one minute, seven seconds, uh, before a major component failure, an MCF, in one of the four engines triggered the abort. It was later determined that a hydraulic system for one of its four engines hit an intentionally conservative limit during the test. Those limits were set specifically for the test, would not have occurred in a flight uh, article, but, uh, you know, again, in the abundance of, uh, of caution, um, it switched itself off. But the important thing is, they never got to gimbal the engines properly and test a lot of the, the uh, throttling up, throttling down. So uh, they only did one minute of an eight minute test. So uh, it is all very likely that they'll repeat this test over the next few weeks. But I haven't heard of a decision on that yet. Uh, SLS, as you know, has already been plagued by delays and cost overruns. You know, a billion dollars plus has gone uh, out the window. Uh, a November 2021 uh, launch date is, remains uncertain, but NASA are doing everything they can to make that happen. There was the checklist, and uh, item eight is the one that still needs to be ticked off, which is a fire your engines for eight minutes. And there's the core stage. And that's what it looks like. It's big and pretty impressive. But for those with a bit of nostalgia, we go back to test stand B2 and uh, you can see that that was the first stage of the Saturn V's were tested there, the S1C. Beautiful shot, but hey, that's not bad either. They had quite a few problems with their front. They did, front. they did, they did. I read a re I, I can't remember. I read something as to why they did that, but they but the 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 limits were actually more stringent in the green run than they would have been for flight. Yeah, I, I know. They probably didn't need to take into account the motion through the atmosphere to work. Oh, anyway, but 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 they they know the problem. It was not when we first heard it. We thought, oh Christ, they've got a real problem here. But it turns out it's it's a fixable thing. And as I said, within the next couple of weeks, you might find that they'll run this green test again, uh, green run. Without those chosen limits, it would apply for eight minutes. Yes. Right. And the space shuttle engines are one of the most reliable engines in the world. They are absolutely magnificent. Uh, if the whole of all the shuttle missions, you only had two that went haywire, something of that that order. It, they are very reliable. You look up the statistics on the space shuttle main engines. They're very reliable engines. And of course, we've got the mobile launch tower there. And uh, that's rigged for the block one. Uh, 
SLS, but block two, they have to build another tower, which they're <laughs> and they're constructing another one as as we speak. And you can see it there. Yeah, I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, the uh, rocket, you'll see the one with the tower, but you have to change everything. And rather than wait to adapt the tower, they're going to build another one. And as we speak, they're uh, putting together the solid rocket boosters in the oh, venerable vertical assembly building. And there's what Peter was talking about. They had three mud uh, crawlers. Um, at the Cape, and they only need two now, so one is being crunched up, demolished. Just on the SRVs, I read somewhere that apparently there's a, there's a, uh, a time limit on how long those boosters can be stacked, so that's going to be another driver with the actual launch dates. Yeah, I'd watch some of those times because if you recall, they said that the core stage could only be filled up nine times. Well, it turns out they can be filled up. 20 times. So some of the numbers you, you yeah, hear. That thing is cool. Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, there's Orion. Uh, it has been designed for deep space, and you'll notice that they're going through the Van Allen radiation belts, which the Apollo, incidentally, uh, tried to avoid and did avoid by going on a more northerly um, trajectory. So that's that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this all shapes up. Orion has been integrated with its service module in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at Kennedy and is being moved to the multi-payload processing facility. And that's what it looks like before it has its skirt uh, put, a, put around it. There it is. Oh, uh, we compare Apollo with Orion. Um, and you can see the skirt has now been put around the uh, service module. And there it is moving, moving out of that facility into another. The old picture I show every time, Artemis 1. This is probably all changed, so I need to get what the update is. Um, now we'll talk about lunar exploration. The CLIPS, Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Many commercial companies are involved in this, and this is about uh, NASA buying services to deliver your payload to the moon. And it involves all those companies, and there's some big names amongst them, like uh, uh, Astrobotic, Blue Origin, of course, uh, like like SpaceX, Len, in case you missed that one. Uh, these companies are of varying size, will bid on delivery of payloads for NASA, including payload integration and operations, launching from the Earth and landing on the surface. So NASA just says, I want my instrument on the moon, how much? Wow, we're not far away from it. Under the Artemis program, commercial deliveries beginning in 2021, that's this year will prefer, perform some of these missions in advance of human uh, exploration. They're gonna spend $2.6 billion through 2028, but no contract has a, a fixed limit. It's just a, a total cap. Um, intuitive machines, Nova C may be the first private spacecraft to soft land on the moon. It will fly on a Falcon 9, uh, and carry 100 kilo, kilograms of cargo to the lunar surface and is targeted for July 21. So only five months away, six months away. I don't, but NASA, there's a number of instruments that are involved, but I, I do know of one, no, it's not this mission. It might be the next one, I'll come to it. Orbit Beyond and Astrobotic also received recent contracts. However, Orbit Beyond pulled out last year. Astrobotic plans to launch its uh, Peregrine lander at about the same time. So they're talking of, but they'd launch on a different rocket, not the Falcon. Peregrine will fly on a different rocket, yeah, United Launch Alliance Vulcan, which is still in development. The 2021 Peregrine mission will be the first uh, for both the lander and its launch vehicle. And there's the intuitive machines that hopefully will be the first one on the moon. And then second will be the Astrobotic Peregrine lander, but I'll talk about that in a minute. That's a little Japanese rover, just sitting where you see the red arrow. Just, just got little wheels there. There it is again, and all the beyond its uh, its uh, lander was no no more. But there's others like Moon Express. They've been developing uh, 
the modular type uh, lunar landers for a while. So the moon is uh, the big, big ticket at the moment. Human landing systems. The last piece of art in this jigsaw puzzle is now taking shape. And, uh, you know, and Bridenstine had a lot to do with that. So that was the last piece of the equation. Without a lander, you're going nowhere. So they're now developing that. Uh, all companies were awarded, uh, all companies awarded the first phase contract, Dynetics, SpaceX and National Team, are uh, all progressing well. Dynetics recently submitted its proposal to NASA, its first set of deliver de deliverables for uh, phase one. Uh, now there's a down select to two or maybe one in early 2021, I think like in the next few, in the next month or two. It was meant to be February. But it was meant to be February, but it might push out. Uh, it's interesting because I think NASA would prefer to never put your eggs in one basket, but uh, you know the budget may force them to go to to one. I hope they don't. Uh, there's a human landing system, and you see the uh, three spacecraft. Each have got pluses and minuses. My favourite, and Len, you'll be surprised by this, but it's Dynetics. I think Dynetics solution is uh, is just magic. Uh, sorry. <laughs> stop with the stop with the funny little name because I don't get it. <laughs> SpaceX. Um, if you go to Boca Chica Spaceport, you'll find that they've got a sort of a, a mock-up of the upper portion of that particular rocket uh, that they're fitting out so that they can flash it to NASA and show them. The national team. The the thing that I worry about that is they've got something like uh, you know a um, I don't know. 10 metre 10 meter ladder. So how they get down from there is beyond me. And it's uh, Blue Origin will provide the lander, which is not reusable. Uh, and um, uh, Lockheed Martin will provide, based on the um, Orion spacecraft uh, technology, they will uh, produce the ascent stage. Uh, Northrop Grumman will produce uh, basically a moon tug that uh, delivers it between the gateway and the, um, the moon. There's Dynetics, love that design. Mm -hmm. SpaceX, I like the elevator. Looks like a 1950s story. Yeah. Doesn't it? Just needs the fins. Up. Needs the fins. Yeah. Elegant solution. But the thing with SpaceX is I don't know what engines they're going to be using. If you have a look at that previous slide, see those uh, just below the door, you've got the three uh, thrusters. They're the ones that actually land the thing on the ground because you can't use the exhaust uh, from the base because you basically dig a crater for yourself and dip over. So they've got these uh, uh, aft-mounted thrusters that will do the final landing on the moon. I haven't seen anything of what those engines are. Now, they're not super Dracos. They've got to be much bigger. They're not going to be Raptors. So I don't know what they're using which means development time. I, I haven't heard that. You might be right, but I haven't heard. Would they plan to fly that off the moon as well? Yes. Yes, and, and, but it'll, it'll launch from Earth with a super heavy. It'll get to the moon and then basically so, just work around the moon. They'll re, refuel it and do... Okay. And do and do its bits and pieces up and down. Yeah, as a oh, it has the main engines. Absolutely. The last those super Dracos, if that's what they are, will only be used in the final uh, moments of landing, just to avoid cratering the uh, the moon. Uh, the national team, you know, made up of uh, the the big guns. Um, again, um, I think that. The reason I'm not a real fan of this, and a lot of people are not, but NASA might go for it because it's the big, the big guns, you know, the Grumman's, the Lockheed Martin's, um, and, and Blue Origin, yeah. It, it looks very Grumman. Grumman's got a bit of experience in this area. They had a bit of experience in this they area, Len. Last time they, they oh, did. Just like they did sorry, yeah. Unless they can read the blueprints from yes. back in the uh, 60s. Look, the difference between all this technology is, remember, Apollo was a use once, get to the moon quick and come back. It was not meant to be sustainable. 
what this is all about is sustainable, sustainability of being able to refuel in flight and land on the moon. So the technology is dramatically different. Copying anything from the 60s would just be a waste of time. Gateway, some components are now being constructed. I saw a panel, I think Sierra Nevada were chiseling out uh, one of the panels that uh, create uh, some of the components of the gateway, but that's still part of the formula. So they're still working on it. There's Andrew Zach, uh, Andrew, Anatoly Zach's uh, rend rendering of that. And this is where it's all combined, but uh, there's only a few bits that will go up uh, over the next, say, five years. SpaceX General, oh, this is a good bit. In 2020, uh, I mean, it launched 26. <laughs> now, this is what I said, Len, runs on the board. Uh, launched 26 uh, times. The only, the only entity that beat it was China. Um, most consecutive successful launches of the Falcon um, 9, uh, 5, Block 5, 79. Block five launches, success, total 50, 50, 50, 100%, most consecutive. Anyway, their statistics, they're, they're mind blowing. The most flights a single booster flew was seven, but uh, this year it was uh, exceeded. But China lands these days, like China flies. Oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> uh, what stops the landing is the ground. <laughs> the Chinese people. <laughs> the Chinese people. So uh, 2021, they've already launched three. This morning they had another one. So Turksat went up, Starlink 16, putting the Starlink uh, uh, satellites up to about 900 at the moment. Uh, Transporter 1 was launched this morning and it was basically a ride share for uh, 43 uh, satellites were launched today. They're you know, CubeSats and small satellites, but nonetheless it's 42. Now there's over 35 more launches on the books for this year. I don't think they'll get there, but holy cow, they might. 20, what, what did I say, 26 last year, maybe 35, 35, maybe 40 this year. Amazing if that happens. Uh, this is just a diagram. I should have acknowledged who drew this because there's a guy uh, you know, in the little fraternity that follows SpaceX that uh, draws these. And I apologize for not him, but he does great drawings, one of many, and you can see what's been reused, how many times, where it's flown, all the rest of it. This one here shows you the booster that launched seven times, and, and this year in uh, Starlink 16, it launched the eighth time. So we had a booster that actually flew eight times. Pretty amazing. There it is, Starlink 16. There's all the Starlinks being deployed. And of course, bullseye landing, as was this morning's, uh, become really commonplace. No one cheers anymore in the SpaceX telecasts when they land. So it's become very commonplace. They've landed 74, um, you know, pretty good. And there it is, uh, after having flown eight times. And if you zoom in on that, you see that it's pretty sooty, as they say. It was white. It was white. It was. They'll, they'll keep using that, I suspect. Um, that, that's this morning's mission, and that's the ride share. And again, bullseye this morning, and they picked up uh, the fairings too. Now, at the moment, they seem, SpaceX seem to be picking them out of the water. They seem to have a mechanism for, you know, refurbishing them and um, rather than catching them. Catching them has proved very difficult. <coughs> So they did that this morning as well. Um, Starship Super Heavy, now well and truly under development. And on the left, you can, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a few slides to show you the size of this thing. But uh, there it is on the left and there it is compared to the Saturn V. So it is one monster of a spaceship. Um, there is Starship compared to the Space Shuttle. Um, remember that the top third of the Starship is, is uh, cargo volume, so pretty impressive. And you can see the little bloke on the uh, hoist there. Uh, that's the little manhole that gets inside. And the super heavy, you'll see the size of the grid fins compared to a person. So that's pretty spectacular. The guy that does the model here is Neopork 
he's uh, he does some great renders too on and models. Yeah, pretty much. And there it is in you know some artist impression, and there it is launching. But one of the more interesting uh, crazy ideas that came out of Elon Musk was the notion that to avoid heavy cumbersome legs at the bottom of super heavy, they might just catch it uh, in midair as it comes down. This I got to see. <laughs> but I'm not going to say he can't do it because he's, he's proved me a wrong on many occasions. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> These are the various configurations that you'll get of the Starship. You'll have the crew version. You'll have a tanker version because uh, they'll need to refuel these things once they're in orbit. The cargo version, the lunar version, and there's obviously just a deep space version. This is what it looks like. Um, you can see that the top third, maybe more, maybe 40% is cargo volume. There's a header tank, liquid oxygen header tank at the top, the nose. And in, in the middle, there's a bulkhead with a little circular thing on the bottom. That's the, uh, um, uh, what do I use? Methanol uh, tank. And they have these little two tanks because that's what they need to land. They can't have uh, the sloshing around of uh, liquid within the main tanks for landing. Now it turns out that, uh, and I'll talk about serial number eight flight, uh, that tank in the middle lost pressurization. They use a system which the space shuttle uses, which is, uh, I forget the word for it, or autogenous pressurization. Um, and uh, but it failed on them. And just to keep the program going, they've uh, uh, basically pressurized using helium. Now they've got helium tanks. What started it all was Starhopper, made of, you know, six mil thick stainless steel plate but it, uh, it showed the power of that Raptor engine, which just blew me away. Then it had a series of uh, serial numbers, the, the, the designated SNs. SN1 was in February. Now remember, this one, just look at the timeline. Uh, Starhopper, 25th of July, 1990, uh, 29th of February, SN1, um, it pretty well blew up. They overpressurized it. SN2, they tested it to a limit, but they didn't blow it up. SN3, they blew that one up. Uh, SN4 was looking okay and then it exploded. Uh, so Elon has an ethos of uh, basically trial and error, production, testing, and moving on. And to me, it seems to prove that particular methodology versus the one of design every possibility out of it and just, you know, he's... He's changing the, the, what's the word? Paradigm. The paradigm, perfect word, for the way you develop things. Uh, it's proving to be very successful. Mind you, they work 24 hours a day in this site where they're building these things. And um, there's a lot of people working there in Boca Chica. And a very healthy budget, extremely healthy. But he knows how to get a good deal, which I'll come to in a minute. This is SN5. This was the first one that flew, um, and um, it had. It was in August last year. It had a big uh, weight on the top, big lump of steel to simulate the nose, and one Raptor engine off centre. Uh, so it had to do some funny manoeuvring. But uh, I thought it was about the engine was about to blow itself up, but it landed before that could happen. But uh, it didn't look good. But it proved that they could do it. Then they had SN6 in September. This was much better, and uh, the engine uh, looked much better in flight. Then they had SN7. Now there's a series of SN7s where they basically do a test um, and then um, basically wreck it. At the moment, they're up to 7.2. That's sitting on the pad as we speak, and it's uh, made out of three mil stainless. It saves something in the order of 40 tonnes out of the whole thing if they can use three mil stainless. Now, this thing has got a, a diameter of nine meters and you're using a skin of three millimeters thick stainless, which is pretty amazing. But if you remember the Atlas boosters, the reason they held up was because they were pressurized. You take away the pressure, there's a famous shot with an Agena on top, the pressure dropped and the whole uh, um, uh, 
body just collapsed. Anyway, this is ASN 8, the 8th of December. And it had three raptors. And I think we should watch this, because this is brilliant. Stage route, let's go for a flight. The reason the engines cut off one by one was because they had to do it because of the height limit. So they had to underperform. Uh, there it is as it was launching. They had to underperform uh, and they had to switch off one by one so they wouldn't exceed the uh, height limit of uh, 12 kilometers. CSN 9 is coming up. Could be tonight, could be tomorrow. And SN9 is only 10 kilometers. So they're going to have the same problem in terms of uh, um, having to underpower their engines. Because three Raptors have got a lot of power. There it is, a beautiful image. And there's my favorite image of that mission. And of course, uh, the ultimate, where they lost pressure in the uh, methane uh, tank. And you started to see the, uh, the engine going green it's probably eating itself out with uh, uh, oxygen rich um, yeah in fact where's the copper comes from is the coils around the actual engines yeah and so it was gone and there were the pieces that they picked up and threw away but of course we've got SN9 and just in front of it you'll see SN 7.2 the three mil a pressure tank and you'll see the little black, sorry, uh, just tell me when you want me to stop. Uh, the uh, tiles um, uh, are testing. They're, they're slowly um, growing the envelope on how many tiles they put onto these, uh, onto these rockets now. Now that's SN9. SN10's in high bay, ready to come out in a matter of days. And they've also got, this is the state of play a few days ago. You'll see SN9 is fully assembled, all done. Uh, SN7.2 sitting there. SN11 uh, has not, the top hasn't been integrated yet and they haven't got the uh, bottom flaps. The SN12, um, I'd say that's what, 60%. SN15, 50%. SN16, SN17, SN18, just started. And this is the um, super heavy, BM1. And BN2 is now started. So, what can I say? It's a pretty amazing effort.
Pfizer have to call this yet? Like putting like FM twenty five or something. Uh, so they might. Just for people's information, SM15 is meant to have a, a number of new technologies, like the thrust pack has been changed to, a, to facilitate the quick changing of engines and stuff like that. So there's a, a lot of improvement and iteration on each version of this thing. And they, they can, they, he's quite happy to blow them all up to, to get the right result. Once they know that, then they'll start to... Uh, move into, into development. Now, I just want to show you a block of chicken, just so you you know what it, what the whole place has looked like, because it's going to become a spaceport without a shadow of a doubt. In Brownsville, Texas, there it is, right on the Rio Grande there. I think uh, during the Trump administration, a few of the feds came down to look at where to put the wall down there. Uh, I don't think they got to build it at that time, but anyway. So there's the spaceport, and you'll see on the bottom, You've got the control center areas, and then uh, right towards the, the beach, if you like, you've got the launch area. What does it look like? Well, you can see <coughs> in the foreground, you've got the construction complex right in the very fore foreground. And this was a picture taken some time ago. You've got the old, they used to extract, uh, I think it was gas from here, but they've now, they're gonna make their own liquid oxygen and their own gas methane from this site, this particular bit. That's being developed right now. This is being developed. You see the high bay is still in construction and the launch site is all the way up the top. So uh, this is moving at a great rate of knots. This was July 2018. That's what it looked like. And that's what it looks like today. January 21, great effort. And there's uh, probably looking at that picture, that's probably SM10 sitting in the uh, high bay. And these are the various buildings and they've got, you know, there's people work, walking, uh, people working there everywhere, day and night. Um, on um, YouTube, I follow Boca Chica Maria. She does every day, she'll do a 15 minute uh, view of the whole site of what's going on. Brilliant. It's, there's no, no commentary, it's just some labels and it just takes you around the site. Well worth, well worth watching. I think it's out of the toilet. <laughs> there's the um, shipyard. This is that northern bit that I was telling you about. And you can see that there's a um, tower. That's a oxygen uh, refract uh, condenser thing with you. Take in air, liquid oxygen comes out. Now they're a long way from the launch site and the uh, LOX methane tank farm, if you like. But uh, even if they have to truck it, it's not gonna be a big deal to, uh, to them. Last bit of the puzzle, for a mere $6 million, they bought, SpaceX just bought two oil rigs. Why? That's their launching platforms. This, uh, basically does away with restrictions, does away with noise, problems that they have to comply with, a whole set of stuff. So these are the method of launching their super heavies and starships of the future. And the idea would be, because one of their aspirations is to have point to point launching, where you know, you'll get your, uh, your boat to the middle of Port Phillip Bay, where one of these things will be sitting in the middle and they'll fly to London in uh, 40 minutes. That'll be something to see. It'll take you about four hours to get in there, but it'll take you 40 minutes to do a suborbital. And then your luggage won't be there. And then your luggage will be on the other star, on the other starship. <laughs> and there's two. They, they got these for a bargain. Uh, three million each. Absolute bargain. And they're now refurbishing these as we speak. Did they have a Yeah. Phobos and Demos. They, from the, uh, the two uh, moons of Mars. And that's what gave it away. There was some SpaceX fan who was hanging around Brownville Harbour there and he spotted an oil rig with the name of Phobos, I think it was, or Demos. Anyway, he said, hey, something, something fishy here. And so he, he looked it up and sure as X. Because Elon Musk, uh, some months ago, talked about, uh, they were looking for oil rig engineers to recruit and they were talking about oil rigs. And there, there they are. Ready to go. The other 
The other recent milestone was Virgin Orbit. Uh, they have a 747 called Cosmic Girl, and they've got the Launcher One, which is a small satellite launcher on the bottom, uh, a la Pegasus, but uh, clearly a little bit more optimized. And that's kind of what it looks like. And this was the actual flight on the 17th of January as it took off. And here we go. This was done by Virgin LC, this is LDN Control Room. We are currently on track uh, for our nominal timeline and our current uh, drop time as listed in Trillion is 1925 UTC. Planet Control Room, flight crew has been boarded the aircraft. Cosmic Girl, this is Orbit Base. You are go for takeoff. Copy, go for takeoff. Altitude 3000. And Orbit Base, Cosmic Girl is starting to turn to the inbound. Pulling now. Pull. Pulling. Release. Release, release, release. Really? This is ignited. Confirm Newton 3 engine startup. Max Alpha cheating. TBC is in first stage looking good. We had a pretty awesome view up here. Max Q Alpha achieved. Stage one burn nominal. They didn't say that you show the oscillation. Stage set break wire broken. Some oscillation on the way up. So you need to be starting now. Newton force startup complete. Covered and we are now returning to base. Bearing brake wires broken. Launcher one's in space. Sounds like a blue sky one purple. This is ready head on control. Mauritius has confirmed acquisition. Payload separation confirmed. So we got SpaceX, uh, Rocket Lab, and Virgin uh, Virgin Orbit. Well done. Now, what to look out for in 2021? Here's a list and a half. These are highlights. I probably missed one or two, but the one obviously, and I know Andrew will do this, uh, these subjects a bit of justice over the coming months, but we've got Perseverance Rover and the Ingenuity Helicopter, 21st of Feb. Look forward to that one. And of course, we've got the United Arab Emirates uh, Orbiter, Hope, that are also arrives in February. Uh, because they were all launched about the same window, Mars window, last year. And, of course, we've got China. China's uh, lander. Uh, it's actually an orbiter, a lander and a rover. Pretty ambitious, but, uh, you know, based on the success uh, of their moon mission last year, uh, which is all training ground for them, uh, this, should be, this should be a success. The other thing the Chinese are going to be launching their Tin, tin uh space station early 2021, perhaps. Uh, other highlights, Boeing Starliner OF2, which I spoke about, the unmanned in, on the 29th of March. And then later in the year, we've got the first manned version of the Starliner. We've also got the first flight of the Vulcan rocket uh, coming up uh, mid to late 21. So that's uh, moving ahead. Then we've got the Astrobotic Peregrine Lander and the little Japanese rover. Uh, we've got uh, commercial clips, uh, initiative, the in, sorry, Intuitive Machines Nova uh, C, which I spoke about. Then we've got DART, Double Asteroid Redirect. And again, I'm sure Andrew will give us a good dissertation on some of these fantastic uh, planetary missions. Uh, we've got Juno, the end of, uh, they've been trying to extend that mission, Andrew. I don't know if you've heard any more, but it's due to come to an end in July and they're going to just basically uh, drop it into Jupiter. <laughs> But if they get an extension, they won't do that, of course. <laughs> then we've got the Lucy mission coming up in November of this year. And that'll, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, Andrew did talk about them last year, where they're going to visit eight Trojan asteroids. So uh, again, I don't know a lot of the science behind this stuff, but uh, the asteroids are getting a lot of, uh, a lot of interest of, uh, over the last couple of years. Of course, Blue Origin's New Glenn, 
Hooray, we might see something from Big Blue. Uh, and then we've got Luna 25, Russia, back on the map. Again, to the South Pole to do some uh, soil analysis and look for ice and a few other bits and pieces. Then we've got Artemis 1, as I said, in November. Hopefully it sticks to November. If not, it might uh, fall into 2022. Um, uh, these are notable mentions, Axiom Space, Dragon Private Crew, to ISS. So they've basically bought a private, uh, bought a capsule off SpaceX or rented one and sent up a few people. I don't know when Tom Cruise is supposed to go up. Does anybody know? He's, he's not part of this Axiom. Uh, anyway, we'll find out. Uh, SpaceX Starship, super heavy. That'll dominate the news for, for a lot of the year because of uh, what they're trying to achieve. The question is, can they get one of these starships to orbit uh, by the end of the year? Unlikely, but looks like maybe next year they will. Firefly, another small um, uh, contender, a small satellite contender. And we've got, of course, passengers finally on Spaceship Two. That may still happen. And we've got Rocket Lab Booster Recovery. We should get one this year. Uh, Blue Origin, New Shepard, Passengers. And I'm not going to play this video because it goes on for a long time. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. We're just thinking the word. Thank you, Angela. That was awesome. Okay, so that's the end of the meeting tonight. If I could just say one thing, the, um, that landing by Perseverance will be on Friday morning at the time, February the 19th. Okay. February the 19th is our time. And um, the TV broadcast, if I've done my time conversions correctly, starts at 6 15 a.m. And the landing, I don't know whether it's the received time or the downtime, is uh, 7 30 a.m. on Friday. And on the Wednesday before, at 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., there'll be briefings. Yeah, we're going to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll go on this to do that. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'll unmute everybody. Yeah, you can hang around. I'm just going to shut down the computer and finish up. Thank you, everyone, for attending.